And so let me start by wearing the hat of the assistant director, then I will be the uh, co-editor. <laughs> uh, so welcome everybody, I'm Leonidas Karakatsanis, assistant director of the British Institute. Uh, we are really happy to see you uh, today here. It's a kind of a combination of uh, celebrating the uh, publication of uh, the book, a long project that uh, took more than four years. Emma will talk a bit ab about it. And we, I would really like to thank our commentators today. It's, it's such a I mean, pleasure to have people reading your work, which is not always the case. It's not very easy to have people reading it. So let me, uh, let me present uh, our two distinguished um, commentators today, which is Burtsu Ejias, who is a professor of archaeology at the Middle East Technical University. Having received a BA degree at Bilkent University, she went on to study at the uh, University of Cincinnati, her, both her MA and PhD. Her research interests and long publication record actually focuses on themes including the Hellenistic period in Anatolia, the archaeology of the Black Sea, archaeological method and theory, Byzantine archaeology, Seljukid archaeology, community archaeology and public involvement. Professor Ergias is the lead investigator on the Comana archaeological research project and has also been leading um, a project on Byzantine and Ottoman archaeology in Tokat. Uh, Shane Brennan is assistant professor of world cultures at the American University in Dubai. He holds a PhD in classics and ancient history from the University of Exeter and a BA and MA from the National University of Ireland, Galloway. And, and until 2016, he was actually in Turkey, working at uh, Mardin Article University. His main subject areas are Greek historiography, political philosophy, minor Asian civilizations, and identity formation in ancient and modern context. But his interests expand to the questions of early human settlement in the Middle East, pre-Islamic history of the Kurds, social change in modern Turkey. He's currently completing a monograph on Xenophon, the Athenian, and co-editing a landmark ancient history ed uh, edition of his analysis. So, uh, I think what we'll do is that uh, Emma will present a like, few things about the book and how it started and how it ended. <laughs> uh, I'll talk briefly about the happy confusion around the concepts that are <laughs> included in the book, and then we'll have uh, the two comments from our commentators, and we can then open the discussion with everybody joining in. Okay, so we thought first of all we'd explain a little bit about how this all came into being. Um, it's the first really interdisciplinary uh, project that the Institute did. It came about as a result of the fact that Leo and I were both postdoctoral fellows here in 2012, from 2012 to 2013 and working on completely different things. Leo's working in social sciences, I'm working in archaeology. So normally our research areas wouldn't have anything to do with each other. Um, but during the time that we were here, we found that we were both looking at borders within our work, and that actually borders formed a really important aspect of both our researches although the researchers were completely unrelated in any other way. So we gradually got to the point of thinking, hang on, this could be a really good thing to play with. Maybe, you know, this is clearly a theme in lots of people's research um, in different fields. It's relevant to lots of people. This is an opportunity to work together. So we put together the workshop, which I think, I mean, well, some of you were there, <laughs> definitely. Um, the workshop ended up happening in June 2013 in Metu, to whom we have to say thank you again. They were extremely kind in hosting us over there. Um, we had people come from all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, really ranging from the deep past up until the present day, all kinds of different academic backgrounds. Um, and it was a very interesting time. It was also the time of the Gezi protests, and Ankara was in a very, very difficult situation. And it, you know, <laughs> we learned a lot from that experience in its own kind of ways as well. It, it proved to be an interesting period. So after that, obviously, it was really successful. We were so happy with the way it came together. We thought, okay, we'll make this into a publication. We'll take the themes, because actually it turned out that people did have a lot to say to each other. It was a, it was a constructive process. People were seeing different perspectives on their own research. 
Um, so we decided to make the volume. It's been it's been a long time in coming. It's been a long process, or since 2013, uh, published earlier this year, in fact. But we hope that we kept the spirit of the workshop, of the original workshop, in the book and made a, a good reflection of what we achieved in that initial work, I hope, uh, within the chapters of the book and within our introduction where we tried to... Yeah. <laughs> within our introduction where we tried to cover all the different possible permutations of borders and boundaries in all the ways we see them, whether that be in the sense of geography, purely physical borders, conceptual borders, uh, temporal borders, particularly within archaeology, it's a massive issue, the problem of um, how we constrict ourselves within time and how we don't communicate with each other, which is a, something we have to get over within the discipline as well, definitely. So we hope that, um, well, we think it's been very successful. A long process, but a fruitful one. And the result, the resulting book is the first interdisciplinary publication of the British Institute. So we're proud of that too. It's a new direction. Good. <laughs> so starting this work as uh, editors, we had uh, uh, a dilemma in front of us. Uh, should we clarify a mess or not? Can we clarify a mess or not? Uh, borders, boundaries, frontiers. Do they mean the same? Uh, do they mean different things? Can we make them make sense by meaning different things or not? Um, initially, I mean, if someone, bef before someone gets into the bibliography, uh, there could be, I mean, the initial approach would be yes, they, I mean, these are kind of similar things, but we can find different ideas in them. Well, by going into the uh, bibliography, one finds this, at the beginning of the 20th century, geographers were trying to make a classification between them. So frontiers uh, was the more abstract notion. And uh, boundaries uh, were used to delimitate the specific boundaries of nation state or geographical boundaries of unities. Um, Things seem to be going at a kind of uh, towards a, a conceptual clarification, and many people had written that you know we need to finally sit down and decide what we mean by using these terms. Social anthropologists and cultural anthropologists at the mid of the 20th century and later reversed that. Boundaries were the, was the more most abstra abstract uh, notion. And borders and frontiers became, in their work, the more specific ones. Um, from that point on, there was a conceptual uh, confusion that kept growing. Why? Because new terms were added into the field uh, of border studies, borderlands, limits, marches. And in the last decade, that border studies has actually expanded as a field towards many disciplines, and, and the intellectual production on the theme has really skyrocketed the last like 15, 20 years. New uh, metaphors started being part of borders as concepts, like borders as tide marks, bo borders as overheated, as capricious, as roughly hewn or fuzzy or new concepts like the idea, very, very interesting idea of book ordering, showing how the borders create regimes of order in specific places, or again, frontiers zo frontier zones, or the interestingly complex idea that I tried to pursue in my own work, frontiers, <coughs> difference. Uh, the question is, um, we were not really sure what to do. Uh, in, in the work, in the edited volumes that have been published in the field, there are two approaches. One approach is that the editors decide to say, we will clarify what we mean by frontier border boundaries, and then the authors do uh, not what the editors decided to, to, to conceptually clarify us. The other approach was to, for editors to say, well, these are used interchangeably, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, I think we followed the a third path, which is considering this a creative confusion. Uh, and by saying a creative confusion, 
What we meant is that we let the authors work on their themes by following their own clarification, or if they decided to use them interchangeably, to use them interchangeably. And then in the, uh, our introduction, uh, we kind of reflect on the way that terminology is used throughout the book. Uh, I think this was uh, important because our aim was, as you see in the introduction, which is, uh, it has, handed, it has been handed over to you, we are trying to locate differences and similarities in the way different disciplines approach borders. So the important thing was not to impose a, a, a conceptual clarification, is actually to work through these differences and similarities. We hope that we were successful in this, but really looking forward to your comments <laughs> now. So, so I will just return back maybe to this. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much and good evening everyone. I would like to start of course by thanking Emma uh, Baisal and Leonidas Karakatsanis for inviting me to provide a commentary for um, this new book, Bordered Places, uh, Bounded Times. And this thanks is due to several factors. Uh, first of all, of course, for encouraging me to think about these very complicated uh, concepts in the context of my own work um, on my own fields of interest within uh, them. Secondly, pressuring me to read a book cover to cover, <laughs> 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 which is an opportunity we rarely give ourselves, actually, these days due to overloads. Uh, and they sent me this valuable piece of um, scholarly work as a gift, which is always a plus. <laughs> uh, and finally, for giving me the chance to become a part of the British Institute community once again for this beautiful event. Uh, I'm confident that the authors, and um, we have read uh, the introduction, hopefully you did too, uh, the authors uh, of the chapters, Emma and Leonidas here, myself and Shane, uh, possibly, and possibly those of you in the audience have been pondering upon the meanings of borders, boundaries, uh, frontiers, some for longer than others, obviously, uh, and have been striving to make sense uh, of the conceptual distinctions between these terms, as you have introduced. Both Susan Sherrod's preface and Emma and Leonidas' introduction uh, very intelligibly discuss these concepts both linguistically and conceptually. Um, these discussions travel between modern day conceptions, um, disciplines which deal with borders, to name a few social anthropology, social geography, political science, archaeology, history of art, and political developments that had an impact on the perceptions of borders as well as the development of the <coughs> field of border studies, which is another important aspect that comes up with the book. The final destination seems to be the recognition of a growth in the interdisciplinarity um, and collaborations, and um, as well as dialogues and uh, development of a new discourse as a result. <laughs> The interdisciplinary nature of the topic is inevitable since any kind of border or boundary in the past or today involve uh, either geography or history, politics, <coughs> identity, cultures, people, wars, nation building, settlement patterns, self-definition, restriction, deprivation, <laughs> migration, <laughs> and this list just goes on and on. These are the, you know, those I could uh, pick up. This interdisciplinarity, I think, is very well reflected in the chapters of this book. Uh, the book and the symposium, I suppose, uh, was designed to include a wide range of topics twirling around the issues of borders, boundaries and frontiers in a wide chronological framework, though limited to the borders, the modern borders of, uh, or the borders of modern Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, the choice of Turkey is also meaningful, I, I believe. While, as Sherrod mentions, uh, it is a tired old cliche to characterize Turkey as a bridge between East and West, uh, rightly so, she draws our attention to this median position even today uh, between being considered, she says, a Near Eastern, but I like to call Middle Eastern country, or a European country. 
this uh, bridge position also taught at schools uh, and some of you are probably familiar with this to be a great advantage and a driving force uh, for developing and maintaining a significant role in world history those big words talking about the geopolitical situation of Turkey um, I believe, uh, in my opinion, uh, disadvantaged societies uh, through centuries, creating challenges to define, maintain, redefine, and um, procure acceptance in these lands. While this uh, difficulty reiterates today in the socio-political and economic spheres, there seems to be uh, some hope in academia, and the book is, I think, the evidence for this um, hope. Emma and Leonidas masterfully brought together, as they promise, archaeology-related disciplines and sociopolitical science in relation to the study of borders. The difficulty of, a, of such a topic for archaeological study seems twofold. One, uh, in the theoretical discourse itself, and um, the other in the available relevant evidence, mm. which uh, limits us in a way, uh, how we look at these uh, terms. When we are, for example, asked to describe our specialization, <coughs> and I was also you know, listening to you uh, introducing me, um, we are expected to present it in a geographical, as well as a, in geographical borders and maybe chronological boundaries. Mm. Um, and this is what we also expect from our students when they propose any kind of work, a paper or a thesis. Uh, we ask them to say where and when, describe, be specific. Uh, so this is... Um, so we have to kind of say where we work and also which period is concerned. And even in its simplest form, uh, it contains already several layers of boundaries in uh, archaeological work. Sometimes we use modern political uh, borders, such as I work in the um, northern Turkey, or at other times we use borders of the past. I work on the Pontic Kingdom. Um, also creating a border, a boundary. Uh, when there is no recognizable political entity in the period on which we specialize, uh, that's a bit more difficult than cultural boundaries uh, lend a helping hand. Mm -hmm. uh, those cultural boundaries distinguished through the spread of material culture, a legacy from culture historical approach in archaeology. The first two chapters, therefore, by Sal and uh, Copanias, provide a much needed critique uh, of the discipline, and it's nowadays involuntary servitude, I like to say, to <laughs> artificial boundaries, as well as boundaries embedded in the archaeological thought itself. Most of the rest of the archaeological chapters deal with some sort of uh, confrontation. Some, like Link, Robinson, and Coparal, present physical manifestations of borders through topography, architecture, and other markers, provoking the creation of symbolic borders, such as uh, perception of massive Taurus mountains for Assyrians and Urartians, or likely the portrayal of uh, the Taurus or Zag Zagros mountains for the Muslim and Christian authors of the seventh century. Borders rarely appear in archaeological chapters as actual lines, but various terms seem to emerge, and on your last slide we had some of them. I picked one, uh, and that's conceptualized borderland. Uh, this is probably the most pre preferred definition for areas and uh, peoples in between, let's say, and authors seem to share the opinion that border zones or borderlands, in a way frontiers, uh, are cross-cutting networks, a term devised by Lightfoot and Martinez, and developed here by Manar. Um, they are also complex zones of interaction, hybridization, placemaking, and products of political imagination, as Armansha puts it. Differences in the perception of these borderlands depend on varying political agendas and differences in needs of different societies, as manifested in, uh, sorry for my spelling, 
Chirsanovska's study of uh, the encounter of the Hittites with uh, Azi Hayasa, or the recognition of zones of mutual interest in the Lycia, uh, Lydian and Ionian case by Hill. The fluidity uh, lies in the repetitive process of alienation, negotiation, and integration, resulting in fluidity, another flu <laughs> fluidity in this time identity of individuals, as well as groups of people. Rodriguez opens the way to Madsen in his quest to understand redefined political borders and readjusted social borders mm. as a result. Now, the last four chapters of the book, uh, which are the non-archaeological chapters, attempt to create a link, uh, the, the source for link, uh, between archaeology and sociopolitical sciences. All but one develop their arguments over actual physical borders, which is different than the archaeological papers. Their intersection with the archaeological papers, however, lies in the fact that all, in all of these papers by Muhic, Muhic, Vukov, Oseiran, and Herzog, another list of uh, terms, identity, ethnicity, ideology, solidarity, negotiations of one sort of another, or another, and memory play a part in the effort to understand borders and boundaries. And um, so once again, I think the book is indeed a great contribution towards interdisciplinary in social sciences and does not, to answer your question, I don't think it does clarify the notion of borders, <laughs> boundaries or frontiers. It is a complex matter. And there you go, there, this is a complex book, if you read it uh, <laughs> cover to cover. <laughs> and um, I would like to finish with a poem on borders, uh, summarizing how I see the borders or, or how I felt after I read the book. This is by Edward Lear, uh, who lived between 1812 and 1881, an English poet and painter known for his playfully absurd nonsense verse. <laughs> Uh, so, there was an old man on the border. There was an old man on the border who lived in the utmost disorder. He danced with the cat and made tea in his hat, which vexed all the folks on the border. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I'd like to start as well by thanking Leo and Emma for inviting me to participate in the launch this evening. Um, it's a pleasure again because, like Bourdieu in reading the book, um, I would say I measurably, my appreciation of the complexity of cultures and history in Anatolia was measurably increased. Um, it was no small task that, that they took on, uh, both tackling the um, conceptual material of borders, frontiers that both Leo and Bourdieu have touched on, but also trying to hold together a large number of chapters from different writers coming from different disciplines. Um, so I think great credit is due to them to, to produce a coherent book. Um, it, it, it's, you know, I think a lot of people would look and think, you're starting with Emma in prehistory and finishing in the contemporary period. How does that fit together in a book? It's a big challenge, and I think they've, they've done that really well. Um, credit to the authors as well. I, I think Mark is on his way, but other than that... Uh, Elif is here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Elif. Uh, uh, well, congratulations. Um, I think, you know... Uh, the cha I, unlike Bourdieu, I didn't quite read all of them, but the ones I read uh, were very impressive. Um, so congratulations to you. Um, I think what what helped or what made the book, of course, is the uh, the underlying um, idea of deep history, which I'm going to talk about or try to talk about in a bit. Um, but I think that gave the book uh, its structure and enable those differing chapters, different time periods, different disciplines to somehow hang together. Um, the other general comment that I have is I think it seems to uh, 
be a landmark in the growth of the institute here, that is the British Institute. I remember when I first came here, must be uh, almost 10 years ago, it was a bastion of archaeology. Um, you'd see the likes of Bourdieu and Geoffrey Summers roaming the library. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I've no doubt that it was a big challenge for the, the steering committee to convince people that they should branch into the future or into the modern world. Um, and it must have been considered as something of a risk at the time. But I think thanks to Leo's efforts and, and Mark, um, who was the first, who was brought in to develop uh, a strand in con the contemporary world, um, that it has been, it was a very successful decision. And this book seems to me to embody that. And its congratulations are due on that count as well. Um, turning to the book itself, um, well, it's about, as we've seen, it's about borders and frontiers, and it's hanging together, it's brought together with this underlying idea of, uh, of deep history. Um, when I started reading it, I, I wasn't familiar with that term, but I am familiar with another term called big history. So I kind of thought, well, maybe, you know, they're different. And maybe they are, and, and you guys might have some thoughts on that. But um, uh, as I read through the book, um, I could see that actually it is uh, very similar to, to big history. Um, I'll say a few words on it, because I appreciate a lot of you may never even have heard of big history. Uh, it's a fairly new discipline. Um, that's become very popular in recent years. And the idea is that instead of um, starting uh, with the first civilization, say in, in Mesopotamia, which we kind of normally think of the cradle of civilization, uh, and then working upwards, um, this big history tends to look at a bigger picture. Uh, and it will go to the Big Bang and look at it from the point of view of a physicist. Now, you don't have to be a physicist to understand the, the formulae and the relationships that are involved. But it's about, mo it's about broadening the perspective. Um, and uh, I think, understandably, it's, become, it's becoming more popular. And I, I see the book as a part of that trend, but also contributing to it. Um, the, the editors, uh, I think they have well, they say in, in the introduction that one of their aims is to bridge a gap between archaeology and, and the contemporary social sciences. Uh, and I think they, they, they managed to do that um, in terms of uh, bringing archaeology more into, uh, into the idea of big history. Um, it's also, I mean, big history, the terms that you get linked with it like shallow history as well that big historians tend to point to conventional historians and label them shallow which seems a bit derogatory but I don't think it's meant in that way it just means that well it's not deep history like like mm -hmm. Emma and Leo have been trying to tackle um, then there are other I mean board you read out a list of labels uh, there's a kind of a frightening array of terminology that you have to try to get to grips with to, to sort of navigate the field. Um, there is, for example, macro history and micro history, which actually map on quite well to the big history and uh, small history. But we, we kind of get confused with all these terms, so I won't, I won't go into them too much. But um, again, it points to what we've all been saying, that it's a really complex field. Um, but the, I think uh, Leo and Emma have done really well to, um, to get into it and, and produce an excellent book. Um, I've looked at, there are two chapters in particular that I looked at, and I'm just going to say a few words on or to comment on, if you like. One was the chapter by uh, Elif Kesser on Northern Mesopotamia, and I picked Northern Mesopotamia because I lived there for five years. Uh, and I really miss not being there anymore. So reading the chapter was a chance to, to revisit the place in a certain sense. Um, another reason was because uh, Elif always produces very interesting and compelling work. Um, and this was, was no exception, uh, the chapter, her chapter on Northern Mesopotamia. 
Um, so, I mean, what she's doing is to, to try and, you know, focus all this talk of deep and big history. She tries to show how that maps onto or applies to a particular region, and she's looking at it uh, in the turn between the, the Roman period and late antiquity, so about the 6th century. Um, and she shows how the presence of a border uh, clearly produces differences on either side. So she takes, for example, the Syriac community and she shows how the, the Syrians on the eastern side changed their tradition, their identity, in order to show that they weren't uh, disloyal to the Sassanids on their side. Uh, and they weren't connected with the Byzantines. So a very real example of how a border uh, solely impacts on a, on a major set of cultural changes. Um, the other thing was, I mean, I often ask myself, I'm sure you do as well, well what is a border? I mean, how do you kind of, uh, how, how, what is it? And usually we're lucky enough to have a river or a mountain or something, and you can get why it's a border. But this area she's talking about, uh, there isn't really anything like a border. So one way to think of it is that we're just not the way we're the societies we live in. We're not really able to uh, um, see like, let's say, the general on his horse saw in the lived experience. Uh, we don't have that those skills. We can't read the landscape. That might be one explanation. Another could be that the fact that there was no obvious border and the creation of a vacuum led to that particular area, what Elif calls, uh, you know, she points out that there was never a border, as in a line with forts on it, but rather, as she calls it, it was a zone. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the presence of that zone, a, a big zone of conflict, was because there was no obvious border there. So the absence of, of a of a physical marker led to it becoming a very contested zone, uh, which it still is today. The area is still uh, a, a very contested border area. Um, the other uh, chapter that I, I looked at, uh, that I read in with, with great interest was the last chapter in the book from, the, from Mark, who's, who's on his way. Um, and I think what, what we have with this chapter is moving from the moving from empires and the ancient world to the modern world and the individual. And Mark comes at the subject, comes at the 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 uh, the order from the editors by looking at looking at this problem of modern identity through the films of Fatih Akin, who uh, I'm sure most of you uh, are are f very familiar with, um, and. Um, he does that, uh, Mark does that very well, um, and it shows how, for example, in the films, individuals are constantly faced with crossing borders of their own identity, uh, renegotiating new borders, redrawing them. Um, one of the thoughts I had is he, he makes the link that in the films, uh, Turkey, Germany is very prominent. Um, and that seems to be a, a recurring reference point in other Turkish artists as well. For example, Orhan Pamuk's book Snow, the lead character, is going back and forth between, between Germany and Turkey. Um, the other thought, and it's the last thought uh, that, I, that I'm going to uh, uh, have, is um, Brexit. Something about reading it uh, came to mind. I'm not quite sure what and maybe people here will have ideas of how this work uh, fits with it. But what I did realize today, thinking about it, was the book does equip us better to understand the very complex issues that surround that phenomenon. And it shows us how relevant borders, hard, soft, whatever way you want to call them, still are today. That today, as we speak, that there's this great crisis in Europe uh, fundamentally about borders. So um, uh, thanks again for uh, giving me the chance to talk here and read the book and congratulations to both of you.
I think we can open the floor to questions, comments, uh, discussion. Uh, you know, it can be uh, quite informal, so anything that comes to mind related to the book or not. <laughs> 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 uh, to the borders, it could be still related. <laughs> <Let's say. laughs> Well, I can start, <laughs> because we, we have the chance to, to have a lunch together with uh, uh, Shane. So, uh, and we started talking a bit about Brexit, and then the issue of uh, Ireland, uh, where Shane is from actually, uh, came into, my, into the discussion. And it's very interesting, uh, because in any case, throughout the book we are actually trying to expose this, com this, uh, this complicated um, uh, aspect, uh, the, the, the multiplicity in the aspect of borders, that's I mean, probably the main theme. Uh, so I was thinking that what is going on now in Ireland, it's so interesting because what you have there, uh, it was a border that, uh, and one, a, a very contested border that was lifted as part of like the, the positive effect of the whole European project. And now there is this discussion of being put back, but uh, the solutions, because this could really bring back the whole dark history of Ireland, the discussions that are now in play, it's very interesting because there is this idea of a, a almost magical non-border, that it will, uh, you have an Ireland that it will be still divided, but non-divided. So the, these latest discussions are actually, uh, I mean, they, they kind of reflect the, f the, the heart of how complex mm -hmm. uh, the whole story can be because it involves, of course, the symbolic issue, the economic issue, the, the actual geographical uh, issue, the, and the economic. So uh, in a sense, I mean, it's a very um, contested and a very present matter the question still is, do we have something to learn by comparing uh, the ancient world with the modern world? And that's my last uh, comment. Uh, for me, there was, I, I thought that because of the complexity of the modern world, that actually a, a modern approach to borders would actually encompass all the challenges that exist in the ancient world. That by, I mean, for those of us engaging with contemporary, the complexity, the, the over, um, how can I say, the, the, the myriad of, myriads of evidence uh, approaches on borders, there wouldn't be anything left that we wouldn't have thought about in relation to how borders were operating in the ancient world. There, of course, it's a question to find evidence on how they're operating. <coughs> But for me, the big surprise and the very positive outcome of this, co of this comparison between these like, extreme ends was this idea that is specifically uh, present in the Hittite uh, chapters of two entities that because of their difference, they share a border which is different from each side. Mm. And what I mean, when you compare the Hittite a uh, state, which is a state, uh, which demarcates its borders with w what lies in its northeast, which is a non-state. It's groups that they are connected in a way. What you have there is a div one border that are, are multiple, because the people see it not only as a different entity. For the Hittite state, it is a border. For the other side, it's not a border. It is a, a zone. It is so. This was for me the a kind of the, the big revelation in all this uh, process of dealing with uh, uh, the book. So I think we stimulated the first question. Oh yes, yes, certainly. <laughs> well. Uh, actually, I was thinking we, about uh, that earlier. Because I think we have a new crowd tonight. Uh -huh. uh, state your name because we are also recording. Yes, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gigai Sadek, associate professor. And I'm a political scientist. Um, in terms of the borders that are complex, we are on the same page. So in that regard, you hit the nail. But still, there is a choice to make. And it's with earlier commentators related. 
Are we going to make it more complicated or should we try to simplify it? And here there is an American saying, I'm not sure, probably you've heard it. Good borders make good neighbors. <laughs> that's the end of, <laughs> not the end of quote, but that's the quote. It's here I am answers. asking you, it's here it's I am answers. asking you, here I am asking you, what does the history offer us? Or what are the lessons learned in that respect? And perhaps, uh, sometimes when already the social phenomena is complex, when you try to further complicate it, well, this may be intellectually stimulating and insightful, but to what extent practical? And in that regard, perhaps I'm asking more policy-relevant question, uh, but what does the history offer us in terms of lessons in, in that regard? Thank you. Emma? <laughs> I think, okay, from my perspective, and my perspective is from the very distant past. <laughs> I would well, there were no borders at all. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not sure about that okay. one. That's a genuinely interesting question, though. Uh -huh. I mean, were there really any borders in the kind of past that I look at? I'm not, I really can't tell you what kind of borders mm -hmm. there were. <coughs> We have to assume that they're actually characterizing these things is almost impossible from my perspective. Mm -hmm. But I think from the point of view of looking at the past, and what I've seen as an archaeologist looking at the modern side of it, which I hadn't done previously, um, and seeing things a bit through Leo's eyes as well during the course of the project, is that, um, I don't know, I think we see in the past an extreme variety of examples. And there are surely lessons to be learned from all of those situations. I mean, we can take examples from all the chapters of the book. Um, we see so many different complicated situations of the fuzzy borders where they, um, there are interactions in something that is conceptually a border, but actually operationally an extremely fluid and mixed area. We see zones, the zone thing is clearly still, I mean, incredibly relevant, particularly with the island situation that we were just talking about, that's still ongoing. We see the effect of, I mean, I think the geographical thing was quite interesting for me, and looking at the historical examples, because I hadn't thought about, we tend to see mountain ranges as obstacles in prehistory, that's the way we look at them, it's not a great approach to things, we always look at them as an obstacle. And the work that I've done recently um, has actually shown me that maybe mountain ranges often aren't obstacles. They're completely different things, actually. They're gateways, they're routes, they're in the most unlikely places imaginable. And actually the historical examples where you see two different perspectives with that physical barrier in the middle, where two different sides can be seeing something absolutely completely different, although they're in fact very close together, is fascinating and also surely still can be seen. The whole issue of perspective is one that's extremely relevant, I think, still. Um, I don't know, I could go on that. I, you know, so many things. The Roman Empire, the effect of the Roman Empire, citizenship or not citizenship, this kind of issue, became, a, you know, became current way back then and is still you know, undeniably extremely relevant. <laughs> um, there's an example uh, from the Achaemenid period, whereby uh, the, the great king, as he was known, there was a, a part of, uh, what, well, northern Mesopotamia, in fact, that um, uh, wasn't paying tribute to the king, and he sent an army, uh, the Greeks say of 120,000, but they always exaggerate, so it wouldn't have been anything like that. But uh, nobody, all of the, the Persian soldiers were killed. Um, and so the king didn't subjugate this rebellious area. Yet the empire continued to prosper in spite of having uh, a fairly you know, small in the context of the, of the size of the empire. Um, but uh, maybe a parallel is something like with Britain in Europe, um, that 
the empire moves on, that the European Union will move on. It will find ways, just like the Persians, it will, they will use different routes. They just won't bother with it. It'll become an irrelevance. Um, so maybe that's something from the past that indicates to us what the future might be like, which isn't very uh, positive news if you're English. <laughs> um, but, you know, you asked a good question and maybe that, that um, is a type of answer. Uh, and just in the modern context, just a, you also have similarly Nagorno Karabakh in in um, in I always get a mix up. It's in it's in it's in Azerbaijan, it's in Azerbaijan but controlled by Armenia. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's a, a even sharper uh, instance. Can I add something? I, I think uh, uh, two ways of answering. Uh, the first is about the complexity issue, because this is the only thing that... Uh, um, there, there is an Indian historian, uh, Partha Chatterjee, has written on nationalism a lot. He says a very nice thing. Um, when I wear the hat of the political social scientist, mm -hmm. my answer to questions is yes and no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, I, when I have to wear the hat of the activist, of the political advisor, my answer is yes or no. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, <laughs> our... The role here is to expose complexity. Uh, and uh, whenever we are called to decide to, as activists, as political subjects, as voters, yes, we will be yes or no to borders, to anything. Uh, the other issue is that I had the chance to, to, to be in uh, New York for, for a few weeks. Big chance, that was a happy <laughs> coincidence. And there was a, a public uh, exhibition throughout the city by the Chinese artists. I, I wait, wait. Uh, which was, it's called Fences uh, May Good Neighbors. It was uh, actually ironic. Um, uh, in the sense that uh, I think when we spell out the word border, uh, we usually uh, mistakenly think of it in, uh, as a snapshot. So bo we say border, we, I mean, that's the mental image, right? Border. Like a wall or something. Uh, or, or, or a static thing, that it's yeah. there. I think the moment we start making science about borders, it's all about uh, challenging, lifting, reposing, uh, changing borders. Uh, I mean, the moment you look at it, so uh, the, uh, can we come up with a normative thinking that borders are good or not? I think we can't. It's, it's the same thing as if thinking whether history has ended or not. I, probably not. So. <laughs> Uh, products can be the, the, uh, the start of peace, but also the start of war. So, case by case, I would say. But thank you for stimulating such, <laughs> a, such <laughs> an interesting debate. <laughs> uh, yes, and then at the back. Okay. I just was going to make a couple of comments. And one is, I think when we're talking about borders, which is this very conceptually messy field, something that uh, helps to focus on is the question of mobility. Hmm what moves, what doesn't move, what circulates, and how mobilities are both defined by borders but also shape borders or borderlands, whichever one you want to use, because it's so critical in defining a borderland is who moves through it. And borders, particularly when you look at the modern state, you know, which is <coughs> borders, they're both fluid, but they're also very rigid at the same time, yes. depending on identities mm -hmm. and who's allowed them. Who's not allowed to move? But I'm sort of interested. I'm not an archaeologist, but in the the idea of walls, because it was this sort of we think of it as an older form of control of mobilities, mm -hmm. and yet they are spreading up all over the world. Mm -hmm. From you know the wall they're attempting. Well, it's almost more than halfway built on the U.S.-Mexico border to the wall in Palestine. To you know there are walls everywhere. And they combine this very, I call them low tech, they're these cement slabs, with very high tech kinds of surveillance. And again, I think mobility and surveillance are two sort of concepts that can play into this, particularly with the archaeology, because the walls do go back so far in human history, and yet we're seeing these walls emerge all over the place as part of defining state and mobility. And getting back to what the gentleman here said about it, fences make good neighbors. That's Robert, a Robert Frost poem. Mm -hmm. And when the Israelis were trying to sell the idea of the wall to the US, that was the phrase they used, was fences make good neighbors. 
and the whole wall technology is kind of a global sort of knowledge that is now going in these circuits as um, export, you know, it's an export phenomenon now to export that knowledge about the wall. So I saw the real connections here with mobility and, and walls, yeah. And would you like to share your name with us for the recording? Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, Julie Petit. Yeah. I'm Charlie Warner, a social anthropologist, American, living in, in Ankara. Um, I really appreciate the um, dynamics and the perspective that this book really brings, to, um, brings together. And it uh, strikes at a question that I've uh, wondered about for some time. Uh, before Ankara, I was uh, living in the Balkans in the Republic of Kosovo. And in Kosovo, as a, a new state forming, they have an, uh, a number of problems, the least of which, or the most of which, depending on how you look at it, is the border demarcation with Montenegro. But also, they are dealing with a um, population identity w uh, problem with Roma, Ashkali, and Egyptian contemporary nomads, if you will, who aren't really used to uh, self-identifying with state institutions, let alone something as relatively new as the Republic of Kosovo. And it's not something, not an issue or a problem, if you will, specific to the Balkans. It happens Central Asia, Far, far East, uh, South America as well. Uh, how do institutions, states, sub-state uh, organizations accommodate or identify or incorporate these contemporary nomads within borders? Mm -hmm times, uh, political governance, what have you. And I would love to hear with, through the research and the compilation of the work and the reading of said work, if there were any uh, parallels or any kind of insights that might have been forgotten uh, over the years about how nomads within these different uh, time periods and geographies might have been accommodated or identified or understood. And if they could share a little bit about that, I'd, it'd be interesting to hear. Thank you, very interesting connection and actually very well, very connected yes, to each other. So, there is, was there mm -hmm. one more? One. Yes. I mean, uh, well, a few of the missions are not the focus of the book, but uh, I was just a bit uh, interested. Uh, working in Anatolia for such a long period of time, was it helpful to follow how nations, uh, following the new borders, uh, mm -hmm. changed or how they challenged the uh, uh, financial communities in Anatolia. Yeah. And can you share your name? Uh, yeah, Aicha. Aicha Baitar. Okay, should we have a round uh, <laughs> of <laughs> sharing thoughts about this? It's not actually answering, but... Maybe uh, I can say a few words about the uh, nomads. <laughs> it's a very new area uh, for me, but uh, we have been excavating at a site where we see the uh, first among the first settlements of the Turkic tribes in Anatolia, um, and 12th, 13th century, and uh, what only well actually this uh, Turks arriving in Anatolia as nomads, um, you know we we don't really know how how much a nomad uh, community they were, because they had already settled in uh, Iran for um, quite a long time. So uh, even this is not very well answered. Uh, but I think this would be a great uh, you know, area to look into in, in depth, because um, it's the Byzantine Empire they are entering into, yet they are uh, moving around very easily, quite comfortably, and not with a lot of um, destruction along the way. We don't see that kind of, uh, it's not like a conquest uh, in, in the way uh, we see the uh, Arabs coming into Anatolia or you know the Achaemenids uh, moving into Anatolia. So um, maybe this is very relevant and it's something to think about uh, further. Uh, in that period, and now that we have more um, evidence coming up, more uh, information coming up, it would be very interesting. Uh, but do I have an answer how they dealt with uh, this situation? No, actually I don't. But I think that um, 
as opposed to our general um, idea that the Turkic tribes entered into Anatolia in 1071, the Mansikert, Battle of Mansikert, and then going uh, through uh, pillaging, it's not really like that. Uh, we have to reconsider how we see uh, partly nomadic, partly you know, uh, military groups moving in, uh, and how the Byzantines dealt with this uh, situation. This would be a very um, good, I think, question. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you, ha you would have to go through historical documents and the very small uh, archaeological evidence available. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's a good point about the... For these groups, there is usually, I suspect, very little archaeology mm -hmm. uh, for, to, to be used to provide any kind of answers. Um, it, it's a very good question, and I'm thinking about uh, tribes in the Achaemenid period in northern or along the, the, the Black Sea coast, uh, of which there were many. Um, I think one thing is, you know, there weren't concepts of citizenship, so there wasn't anything that somebody had to do to prove they were somebody or to go somewhere else. The, the Persian attitude seemed to be towards tribes, if they pay their taxes, then we leave them alone. Um, that was so the, the tribute, as they called it, and it didn't have to be cash, it could be if you produced, like, horses or something, then you send horses. Um, so, but, but the Persians were, were famously uh, easy in terms of, you know, they didn't impose a lot of uh, laws or require people to do things. It's pretty much, as I said, if you paid your taxes, well, you can do what you want. But the question does prompt thinking about, uh, well, wh what was there then? Was there anything else? Uh, because they would have, there would be a satrap or governor of the region. What was the relationship? Uh, between him and the tribes and some evidence there is evidence to to say that they frequently negotiated with one another um, so I think there there's uh, I don't think it's like with like I think the modern context is is different to the ancient one um, mainly because it in at least in the Persian case the model of government was different um, uh, but you know I would guess that you know, uh, somebody from the Masoniki or the Kalibs or the Colchians living in the Pontus area could pretty much go wherever they wanted. Uh, I don't think there was anybody going to stop them or ask them who they are. There wasn't, wouldn't have been a border that they, they had to cross. Um, but if you entered their territory, um, then you could, you could conceivably end up badly um, as kind of lots of invading armies. Found. So that's just my perspective on that. Um, okay, so I can come at it from a very, very different perspective, which is thinking about the question backwards and thinking from the time when pretty much everybody, or actually everybody, was nomadic, which is what we're looking at in, say, the Epipaleolithic period. Uh, Paleolithic and Epipaleolithic period. And we're only just beginning to get to grips with this. It's particularly interesting in Turkey to see how this worked, um, particularly, as I was saying, with relation to things like uh, mountain ranges and things that we see as massive obstacles that actually the new archaeological information is beginning to show us were not obstacles at all in the past or were considered to be absolutely OK and... Um, part of the way that life flowed, I suppose. And um, I mean, it is, it's, it's a very much a work in progress, this field, but thinking about how those people who constantly moved through the landscape and presumably interacted with each other as different groups as well. I mean, we don't really know how many different groups, or I, I don't even know how we would begin to think about how many groups there were uh, in Anatolia, say, in the Epipaleolithic period. It's, 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 it's a very difficult thing to think about and, you know, material culture is difficult to work with in this respect. They don't necessarily express themselves as groups and trying to reduce it to that is very difficult. But what we do know is that these extremely mobile groups gradually become 
not mobile, they become sedentary. And then thinking about the process of the Neolithic and settling down, and how the groups gradually becoming sedentary related to the the, inevit the, the fact that there was inevitably a huge part of the population who didn't become sedentary. I think we've made a big mistake in always thinking that the Neolithic meant mm. that everybody settled down. They, mm. I'm absolutely mm. certain that, that it can't possibly ever have happened like that. I'm sure at least for you know, several thousand years, the majority of the population was still on the move. And we're beginning to see that now. It's requiring a huge amount of data to get to grips with this. But we're beginning to see materials moving around and materials moving with people, not just the materials <laughs> flying around on their own, which we might have implied previously <laughs> in some publications. Um, you know, trying to understand how materials move with people, is a, it's, it's fairly abstract, but this definitely existed as an issue from, you know, from the time that some people stopped moving and you start having that as an issue, how did they interact? Were they related to each other? You know, there's it's so many things, but it's, we'll see. It's progressing this, the very early stuff is moving along quite quickly at the moment. Uh, Mary here is, <laughs> is directing two excavations. This is your three excavations. Okay, three <laughs> excavations. <laughs> So they're currently all telling us about these movements of people yeah, who really too. didn't stay in one place, right? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting work in progress, this. Uh, actually, I would like to address quickly the three questions uh, kind of together. Th I'm thinking the book through your questions mm -hmm. now, and oh. I think there is a very interesting thing that, uh, on mobility and uh, nomadic life. First of all, if you think about it, how the book develops, a mobility as the main issue of chapters on borders uh, evolves the moment we start uh, speaking for, uh, about modern times and about the experience. Mm -hmm. Because border as, a, as an experience is an experience of mobility. So if you think about it, actually it's the last, la like <coughs> really, the last four chapters that, because it, it's, it's chapters that deal with the people themselves, and not, not the evidence about borders, not the evidence of, uh, you know, dead people, <laughs> but the <laughs> live people and who, who can share their experiences yes. with the researcher. Uh, nomadic, th this, this I, I'm, it, I'm just thinking through it, but mm -hmm. I think there is one very interesting case uh, that Osserian uh, makes. Uh, can we see, uh, displacement as a forced nomadic life. Uh, for instance, the Syrian, uh, what she, she presents about Syrians in Turkey is a continuous um, mm -hmm. journey back and forth by trying to reach somewhere. But mm -hmm. since this reaching of that somewhere is continuously prolonged, you actually have nomadic life. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think this is a very, I mean, it's not framed that, as that in the chapter, but this is really the bulk of the whole story. It's thinking this movement by land border landmarks. Uh, at the time that she was doing the research, by the way, it's very interesting because it was the time that the Turkish government had really decided to safeguard the EU, the Turkey EU border against the crossing of Syrian uh, population. So it was a period that nobody could cross. The big, the big issue of the migrants was how can we cross to Europe because it was the absolutely uh, non-crossable border. While when she finished the chapter, this thing suddenly changed and it was like a, a huge flow. So I think this, these are interesting things to think through. But I think the book offers few ideas if one comes to reflect through mm -hmm. these questions on the book. And on nationalism, uh, I, okay, I think we have to reveal that, that we actually have a small gap in the book, which is Ottoman history itself. Uh, and this is because we, I mean, the, you know, this was a, a, a call for papers for the, for the workshop, and the, no, we didn't have papers on Ottoman history, and then we decided to keep going with the people that were on the workshop, because it was really a very intense process of editing, 
And so it, we decided not to bring in people to fill the gap. But I think what we have, and this is very interesting because it's cases that deal with the Ottoman past uh, through the new national borders. And it's interesting that these two cases are Bulgaria and Macedonia. So it's mm -hmm. actually uh, reflecting all this period of border and national identity creation and how the Ottoman remnants of this is still so very dominant and so very vivid until today in these areas. And um, so I think nationalism is very present as a concept in the book without necessarily being a concept of it. Uh, <coughs> from a political perspective, again, a mobility. I think that as soon as the first states um, appear in Mesopotamia, we're talking about fourth millennium, uh, mobile communities are actually the enemy, they are actually a destructive and disruptive force. Mm. And uh, in fact, I mean, throughout time, states have tried to sedentarize them. I mean, the, 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 the Ottoman state did it, the Romans did it, and because mm -hmm. once they are settled, they are much more controllable, but when they are mobile, you don't know what they can do, where they are. And I think that throughout Near Eastern history, they are cross fertilization force because uh, since the time you, you have the first uh, wall actually is uh, the, the first sort of non around the settlement but regional wall is called the defender of the Amorites it's 2200 BC is against this uh, nomadic communities in Zagros they are trying to get to Mesopotamia mm -hmm. and uh, I mean the wall doesn't really work because after 10 or 15 years uh, the, the whole of southern Mesopotamia gets invaded and the Amorites start a new sort of cycle of uh, they, they settle down and they start a new cycle so and th that happens also um, in the Achaemenid period it happens with the Romans and the Germanic tribes mm. I mean when when they break through the walls they they start something anew they they, they bring new blood to, to 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 the empire I mean to to new to new civilizations in a, in a way so I think that, uh, yes, mobile communities are very um, dangerous for, for the status quo, but they are also uh, those that bring new, new energies. First of all, I would like to thank you for the mentor's work, and I should also confess that I suffered all the phases of the confusion about the concept about the borders, <laughs> borders and boundaries, because the article was coming <laughs> back and forth <laughs> and trying to put the, you know, the concepts and it was a time, I remember, it's very special for me because it was during the Gezi times and that was the time when we were aware of the social boundaries uh, you know, forming in Turkey and now we are living through it. But uh, to me, I think uh, it was very clear because, uh, of course, I mean, I spent a lot of time thinking about those concepts. But I'm still coming up with the clear idea that when we are talking about uh, frontiers or the boundaries, we are talking about the social concepts. But when we are talking about the borders, it's something about the state. I mean, this, when, when there's a state, and when there's a state formation, there's a border. And I saw the Iowa Ways work as well. Mm. And it's very ironic that it's entitled as the human flow and the borders cannot stand against the human flows and it creates the boundaries and the frontiers <laughs> and that's why I just wanted to you know, speak about it. <laughs> it was, that was a great experience and I also thank you of course. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Is this that we're going to end on that happy note? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so thank you very much all for coming this one of the first very cold nights of Ankara. <laughs> Welcoming the winter and uh, celebrating the book. Uh, thanks for the discussion and we can go in for a wine uh, and a few. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>